Richard is the founder of uh, Resilient Music and um, works for um, very large consumer brands. And he's going to present us a case study. Hello. Right, well, thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Richard Kirsten from Resilient Music, and um, I'm going to talk to you about music licensing and use um, a case study for a project that I did for Peroni, which is one of the brands within the SAB Miller Group. So, firstly, we'll talk about Peroni and its relationship to fashion and style. Um, why is this brand relevant? Well, SAB Miller relaunched Peroni, or Peroni uh, Nastra Azzurro, as its full title is P&I here, um, in 2005. Um, they found that the, the beer market had become rather unfashionable. Um, and they wanted to try to relaunch Peroni in a different way, to present it as a style brand, um, to uh, build on its heritage and its connection with Italy, to market it in a, in a completely different way to the, to the way that some of their competitors would market um, other beers. And the aim with this was to set um, Peroni apart. Um, they wanted to position it to a completely different audience. Um, they wanted to um, achieve cut through through collaborations in quite an artistic way um, with various partners, particularly in the fashion world. And, and in order to do this, they needed to produce work of a much higher creative standard. Um, and you'll you'll see from some of the images within this this presentation that their styling is very much um, in line with the way fashion brands present themselves, rather than the way um, other beer brands do. So we'll look at one or two of the collaborations. Um, here's one that they did with Vogue Italia. Um, this dates back to 2007. Um, Peroni wanted to build on a close relationship with the Italian fashion industry. Um, they felt that they had shared values, um, particularly in craftsmanship and in authenticity. And building on that, they worked on a London photo exhibition um, called 50 Years of Italian Style, using a lot of the iconic images of models um, of designers and of fashion collections. Um, and the aim here was to talk about capturing the Italian spirit. This is one particular image from that project. Here's another one, something they did in London. Um, you can see here the idea of um, every street is a catwalk using the Millennium Bridge as a catwalk with models. So a kind of takeover exercise, but with very high visibility branding um, and also the I iconic St Paul's Cathedral in the background. Um, but a great idea, turning a, a, an outdoor space into something that you would normally see in a fashion show. And then more recently, a project that was done at Somerset House. And for those of you that know the space, um, it's used for a lot of exhibitions. Um, it's used for a lot of sort of branded events. But here was something they did to mark the 150th anniversary of the unified Italian state. They put on a, another photographic exhibition um, together with six of Italy's leading fashion houses. So Giorgio Armani, Dolce & Gabbana, Salvatore Ferragamo, Gucci, Missoni, and Prada. And if you're familiar with the um, Somerset House space, it's a very iconic building, um, has an enormous amount of heritage. It works very well in it's that um, It's also the, the, the registered office of the um, British Fashion Council. So it's also mm. quite associated with fashion. It's a very good place. So, um, we're now going to look at a particular uh, Peroni campaign which launched last year um, and one in which I was involved in clearing the music. And, and the reason I picked this, um, it's, it's quite unusual for a commercial to have two pieces of music, which this does. Um, and the licensing and legal issues around how this came about are quite interesting. And there were quite a lot of interesting um, things that we learned acting for the brand. So, let's start. Presumably that will play. Right, so you notice there's two, piece, two pieces of music on there. There's a short orchestral piece at the beginning, um, and then it moves into a, an iconic 60s song. Um, Peroni stylistically has a very strong association with the 60s. It's something that they use in their visual imagery, and um, typically they, they use songs from that era um, to kind of fit in with that heritage. So we're going to talk about how um, some of this deal was done. Um, 
So, there was a need for two music tracks, and the brand had very clear ideas about specifically the songs that they wanted. Um, there's a short filmic orchestral score at the beginning, and then an iconic 1960s song. Um, they had no backups, which is not a great place to be if you're negotiating a deal. Um, we talk a lot to our clients about the need to you know, have a hero track and perhaps a couple of backup options um, that could be used in the event that the price is too high or you can't um, secure permission on a particular track. In this case, the brand were, no, we want this and nothing else. So that, that's quite a challenging place to be. Um, they wanted a two-year license for cinema and a two-year license for online. Again, this is quite unusual. Most um, music deals are done on the basis of a one-year fixed term with extensions for a further second year or perhaps a further third year. Um, there were also, as often happens with global campaigns, staggered markets. Um, in other words, one market might start at the beginning of this two-year term, others would follow at various points, but they weren't clear in their marketing, um, in their media plan, when each market might come online. Um, there were no clear advanced decisions, and that made it quite difficult to know whether or not we could put a deal together based on um, options in individual markets or if we had to broker a worldwide deal. We started negotiating this back in November 2012, although the actual campaign didn't start until May 2013. So we're negotiating with right side is about a usage that's going to start six months in the future, um, which for them is quite a tricky thing to consider because they're thinking, well, will we get any better offers um, in within that time frame? And do we want to commit ourselves um, for a campaign that starts six months hence that then carries on for a further two years? This, this we found to be quite a problem. So I'm going to talk you through some of the process involved in actually clearing music rights. Um, some of this uh, may be familiar to some of you, some may be familiar. <coughs> So the first thing you need to do when working with a brand is clarify usage, which sounds very obvious, but with a lot of brands, we find that at the beginning of their campaign, they simply don't know when, where, how they plan to use the music. They might say, oh, well, maybe TV, maybe cinema, maybe radio, and sort of online somewhere. Um, and that's fine within a brand team, but when you're negotiating with music rights owners, um, they want much more detail. They won't just say, fine, internet, online. They want to know exactly when, where, how, which URLs, which social media platforms. They want definitions. Um, the three key drivers of usage are term, markets, and media. So as much detail as possible around those three areas. Product exclusivity. So um, alcohol brands typically might say, um, we want exclusivity across all forms of beverage. When they receive a quote like that for that, which is typically a very high um, mark on the initial fee, they might reduce it to go, okay, well, let's just look at alcohol. And then they might narrow it down, let's just look at larger beers. And then they might narrow it down, let's just look at larger beers. And then they might narrow it down, let's just look at popular beers. For the greater, as, as, as is perhaps quite obvious, the greater the breadth of the exclusivity that you might want, the more that you would pay. So whatever the license to you agree, you might pay an uplift of 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 cent, perhaps even 100 cent, depending on the breadth of the You might also then look at what options you need to extend your term, your territory, your media. So, so typically, when you're doing these license deals, if you have one year term, you want a second year, you may say the same year, again, plus 10 cents. Some music license are 20 cents. If you want to extend their markets, there will be uh, a ratio, ratio of these rights right right terms will be used, depending, depending on how, how popular that market, that market is. is. So, so typically, in the most, most expensive market, market would be the US. US. If you were looking at some um, minor, minor East 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 market, that, that would be considered a We've put together um, all of your required usage. You can either ask music rights owners for a quote or present offers, which generally is what we do. Um, and we will go in with a low offer, knowing that they're going to count as a higher. Um, we'll present that in a deal memo or heads of agreement and submit that. Clearly the next step is you, you've got to identify your rights owners, which isn't always as easy as it might sound. Um, in the UK we use um, databases of the two main collection societies. Some of you may know of PRS for Music, which acts for songwriters and music publishers, and PPL that acts for record labels. And using these two databases usually you can establish which record label or music publisher or publishers are involved in a particular piece of music. 
It's important to know um, that songs frequently have multiple music publishers. So the song, the main song in that film, um, there's always something there to remind me, has two music publishers, and you have to strike deals with both of them. Um, you also need to be aware of the approval party chain. So we might be doing a deal in the UK with the UK offices of a record label or a music publisher, but if the song is originally controlled somewhere else, so there's always something there to remind me is controlled in America, the people we deal with in the UK have to deal with their counterparts in the US, who in turn have to deal with the original songwriters. Or in the case of, as we'll see, one of the songwriters was dead, so they're then dealing with his in the state. Um, so that you, you need to be aware of how long that approval chain is in order to get a sense of how complex the deal is going to be to, to secure and how long it might take. And it's important that, uh, as a consultant working with a brand, we alert the brand to this and say, look, by the way, each transaction goes up a line of three or four people and it could take a week just to get to the other end and another week to get an answer back. We submit offers. We have to be aware of this thing called most favoured nations. Now, who, who in the room is familiar with that? Okay, do you know how that applies to music? Yeah. Okay. And producer, uh, yes, yes. So, <laughs> most favoured nations is this um, device whereby music rights owners, and we'll look in a minute at the difference between songs and recordings, insist on receiving the same fee. But it only goes up. It never comes down. So if a music publisher quotes here and a record label quotes there, most favoured nations with the publisher, their fee will rise. Um, it never goes the other way. It's a lazy way of quoting, but a lot of them do it. Um, clearly negotiating fees is part of this process. Um, during this negotiation, we had to reconfigure the options because the client changed what they decided they needed. And eventually you reach an in-principle agreement um, on fees. Um, but uh, at that point, it's just an in-principle subject to approval um, agreement, which means that the rights owners then have to take your offer to their approval parties, who can, as was the case here, say, well, actually, we don't think that's enough money, or we're not happy with a two-year term, or we don't want to grant rights in the US, and then you renegotiate the deal further. So securing your in-principle approval is just that first step. Um, and eventually, through further negotiation, you reach um, a full approval, but still subject to contract. And the way the music rights industry works tends to be that you can put your campaign on air or online, having secured your in-principle approval, um, even though you deal with the long-form licenses after the event. So it's quite common for the ad to be on air, and you're still negotiating the long-form licenses. But you've got an approval either by a form of a signed deal memo, or an email chain which says, yes, these terms are approved, that allows you to do it. This often seems quite strange to corporate lawyers who would like to see fully executed long-form agreements before you go to air. The reality is that quite often with commercials, music's chosen very late in the day, and you might often only secure in, in principle approval a day or two before the, the commercial is played out. So the long-form contracts happen after the event. So finally, um, before the campaign goes to air, Ideally, you should pay the license fee because all these licenses are um, only valid once the fee is paid. For this project that happened, for quite a number of I work on, it doesn't happen because the appro approval happens so late in the day. The rights owners, if they are, unless they are very small independents, will have their own template long-form licenses and they will insist on using those. They'll issue those, we'll review them, we'll mark them up, liaise with our client's legal department. Um, uh, and one of the key things to note is that music rights licenses always cap the level of indemnity at the level of the sync fee, um, which is usually which is quite an alarming thing for corporate lawyers to get their head around, because it might be a relatively small deal where you may have a ten grand fee to the publisher, a ten grand fee to the record label, and that's the level of indemnity you're going to get. You won't get any more. Um, so even though you are reliant on the warranty in the license that that rights owner has the right to grant the license and so owns the copyright, you're capped. Um, and that can be a worry, but that's the way the business works. And eventually, you get a fully executed license, which is what you rely on. So I'm now going to look at the difference between songs and recordings, um, just to kind of clarify how this works. So using this example, um, there's always something there to remind me. 
Um, I've used a copy of the original um, vinyl inlay um, and the sheet music to demonstrate these two rights. So here we have the copyright in the song, often known as publishing rights. Here we have the copyright in the sound recording, often known as master rights. Are you all with me so far? Okay. So, um, the master rights in this song, the copyright in the sound recording, performed by Sandy Shaw, recorded in 1964. Um, the record label that now controls it is called Union Square Music, and they license what are called the master synchronization or the master sync rights. Um, there are, however, 41 session musicians on that recording, and all of those are members of the Musicians' Union. So what's relevant about that? Who's familiar with the connection between master rights and union fees? Anyone? So the key thing here is that when you get a master sync license from a record label, they have typically the rights to grant the recorded performance of the featured artist, but not the session musicians, if they are members of a union. And separately, you have to negotiate a deal with that performance union and pay them a separate fee to whatever you pay to the record label. The only occasion where you wouldn't do that is if all the rights of those session musicians were bought out at the time of the recording to include the rights to grant sync licenses. But for most recordings made in the UK or the US, that's not the case, and you have to deal with unions. Separately, the copyright in the song. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, Burt Bacharach and Hal David, two iconic, very famous American songwriters, wrote many, many hits. Each of them have a separate publisher. Um, one is with Universal Music Publishing, which is Hal David, and um, but Backrack is with Warner Chapel. What's complicated is Hal David um, sadly passed away I think, a couple of years ago, not long before this deal started, um, and therefore at the end of his approval chain was his son, who is extremely um, protective about his estate, and that proved to be quite, quite challenging. Um, the other piece of music in this commercial, that short little orchestral clip at the beginning, is actually taken from um, an original soundtrack score by Ennio Morricone, extremely famous Italian film composer, and, and in this case it's the score from Once Upon a Time in America. Um, this soundtrack was performed by, with Ennio Morricone conducting and his orchestra in Italy. The recording was owned by a small label called Discord, but all of the orchestral musicians had their uh, rights bought out at the time of the session. So there were no additional union fees to pay for this. The publishing rights in his composition was controlled by Warner Chapel. So if you remember, they owned 50% of the song that we were dealing with um, and 100% of this orchestral cue. So they're actually involved in both deals. So two separate, um, comp two separate songs and recordings um, one record label and two publishers for the song, one record label and one public publisher for this piece of orchestral score. So there's five licenses um, in that, plus the union fees for um, the session musicians on the song. So, some of the issues that came up on this project. Um, certainly the complexities around dealing with um, estates. It slows things down, they're more protective, um, they tend to be slower to respond, and given that Hal David had recently died, um, it was very it had to be handled with enormous sensitivity. And fortunately the people we dealt with at Warner Chapel were very good at that. Um, there was a need for holding fees because we were dealing with a license um, that where the usage wasn't going to start for six months in advance. The publishers of the song insisted on having a holding fee just for the privilege of granting approval, and that holding fee was non-returnable if our client decided they didn't want to go ahead. Now, our client thought that was outrageous, and rightly so, but the publishers took the view, you want our song? That's the deal. Take it or leave it. So we had to pay that. Um, there was then an uplift for product exclusivity. In the, end, in the event, it wasn't um, actually exercised. We also initially tried to negotiate um, options for individual markets, and the publishers refused to do that. Their attitude was, if you want this, it's for the world for a large sum of money, otherwise find another song. So in the end, we bought a worldwide license. Um, they insisted on very tight media definitions, which initially our client wasn't able to, to provide, so we had to coax them into making some assumptions about exactly what they needed. Um, and we also had to present very different uh, definitions for online and offline. 
um, the client and their agencies found it quite difficult to clearly define exactly what online use they needed. So what are the key takeouts for brands from this project? Um, I always recommend to clients start early. Um, the earlier you can start on something, the more leverage you've got, um, particularly um, if you give yourself some other options. So here, have hero tracks and backups. Um, this project was difficult because our client insisted that there was no other song or recording that would work. I would always say to clients, give yourself some options. It, it means that you then have a walkaway position on fees. So if you decide that the quotes that are coming back are so high, you can credibly say, we will go somewhere else unless you reduce it. And sometimes that will work. Um, earlier on, I've talked about secure the uh, upfront media schedule. Um, this is difficult. Most brands find that their, their media agencies will, will give final clarification on the media schedule quite late in the day. But this is a real problem when you're licensing rights. You need to know upfront exactly how that campaign is going to be used. And more importantly, that that media schedule is not going to subsequently change. We see this very regularly. We're negotiating a deal and our client says, oh, by the way, uh, we've now decided to run this in Australia and France, and that thing we were going to do in Germany is now over here rather than there. Um, and this makes the negotiation difficult. Geo-locking online. This comes up a lot for single or multiple market um, offline campaigns where the client also needs an online element. Music rights owners will insist that the online element is limited to those same markets. So if you can't geolock it, um, they will charge a much higher fee for the privilege of, of a, a global online license. So geolocking is a process that I, I understand if a brand is a, a YouTube partner, they can um, limit the availability of that YouTube clip to certain markets. Um, it's harder to do with the brand's corporate website, but with YouTube it can be done. It's quite a complex process from what I understand, but it is possible. Um, the need to pay license fees before first transmission. The more um, militant and aggressive rights owners, in the worst cases, will injunct a commercial if the license fees haven't been paid up front. Um, it's important to know that the music rights owners will have fixed templates licenses with fixed T and Cs that they may or may not be willing to negotiate, um, and that the indemnities uh, within the warranties in those licenses will be capped at the level of sick fees. Um, and finally, the kind of um, parties that you would be dealing with in brokering deals with um, with music or uh, with music talent, artist managers, um, if you're putting together an artist partnership agreement, um, typically you're going to be dealing with that artist manager um, and quite, quite probably their, their lawyer. Record labels, if you're licensing um, existing sound recordings, or if you are recording or filming an artist to create something for a particular campaign, you need waivers uh, for artists who are under exclusive um, record deals, and those are granted by record labels. Music publishers, if you're licensing songs or lyrics. Um, live booking agents, if you're booking the artist to perform live for you in any way. Um, music supervisors might be... Um, a uh, specialist consultant that you might want to hire to help you navigate your way around these things. Um, they, together with music clearance consultants. The music supervisors tend to be more on the creative side, the clearance consultants tend to be more on the, uh, the legal side. Um, so that's the, the end of this. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions on music licensing? Thank you very much for this enlightening your presentation, Richard. Um, so where are the lawyers? Where are the lawyers in this? Um, if we're acting directly for a brand, um, we will liaise with the lawyers at the point where there's a long-form license. Um, that's usually quite late in the day. Where a brand is working with an agency, usually they have no visibility over that. Um, we like to involve the, uh, the corporate lawyers so they have input into the long-form license. Quite often they're not familiar with the idiosyncrasies of how the music industry works, so we will spend time explaining how these templates work. Some of the publishers use um, templates agreed in the UK between their trade body, the Music Publishers Association, and the IPA, which is the trade body that acts for most advertising agencies in the UK, and they are a fixed set of TNCs that do not change. Thank you. Um, and, you know, they'll have their comments and we'll try to take them on board. Yes. 
And have license fees gone up or down in the last five years or stayed the same? It's a very good question. Um, in many cases, they've gone down. Um, I think gone are the days of six-figure license deals. Um, I started working in this area about 20 years ago, and in the 90s, acting for a music publisher, did a number of deals in the sort of multiple hundreds of thousands of pounds. These things rarely happen. Um, there's been a huge shift in the attitude of talent um, who would, perhaps 10, 15 years ago, would be very sniffy about doing anything with brands. Um, the younger generation of artists can't get enough of it. Um, so they are far more willing to have their, their music used in commercials or in branded campaigns, so as a result that brings some downward pressure on fees. What works in the other way is that, of course, the sales of recorded music have fallen very dramatically, so record labels and publishers are trying to um, compensate with higher fees. Um, so I'd say overall they've gone down, but that doesn't mean that the record labels and publishers um, are a walkover by any means. Yes? How much of a concern is it that the rights holders might be different to another country that you're getting license from from the people that you're speaking to? Might be different in another country? Well, they might. I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, is that possible? It, it is. Um, it's quite normal that you would deal with a party in the UK um, who, if it's a publisher, are a sub-publisher of the original publisher. So in the case of Warner Chapel and Universal, um, for there's always something there to remind me, we're dealing with the UK sub-publishers of other parties. The key thing to establish is that do they have the right to grant global licenses? And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I've worked on deals where um, in some cases you have to approach a number of parties. You, you might deal with a party in the UK which says, we've got World US, World X US, go and talk to these people who control the US and we've got to do both deals. Usually, rights owners can grant a global license. But it's a good, a good point. Yes? In the case of a company commissioning an artist um, to create a unique piece of music for a network, yeah. um, does it simplify dramatically the process? Um, it can be more complex. So if, if the artist is also a songwriter and they are under an exclusive publishing agreement, then um, even though you might have commissioned them to create this new work, their publisher will still own that song or that composition. So you still need a publishing sync license. Um, you would probably have to have a commissioning agreement with the artist via their manager, although that commissioning agreement would need to recognise any exclusive recording or publishing agreement that they already had. If you're paying for that artist to go into the studio wearing their hat as an artist rather than a songwriter, you need a waiver from their record label for the privilege of recording them. But even though you're paying for that recording to take place, their record label will own it because if they're under an exclusive recording agreement, they own their exclusive recording services. So then you need a, um, uh, not only do you need a waiver from the record label, you need a master sync license if you are synchronizing that recording with a piece of visual imagery. So. The summary of that is you've got a commissioning agreement, a waiver, a master sync license, and a publishing sync license. So it's actually more complicated than just licensing an existing track. The, um, the exception would be if you're dealing with an, unsi an unsigned artist and an unpublished songwriter, you could probably have one agreement that wraps up everything. And if you have real leverage, you might even be able to get an assignment of copyright in either the song or the recording or both, as opposed to a license. Thank you very much, Richard.